Let's go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. I am Sarah Feldman with the Consortium for Service Innovation. Matt Seaman and Kelly Murray from the Consortium staff are also on this call today, along with a bunch of wonderful certified KCS trainers. Uh, I will highlight them even more so in a minute. Uh, I hope this is what you came to talk about today. Designing KCS for your organization. This is very much inspired by the KCS Adoption and Transformation Guide, Phase 1, uh, Plan and Design. We will be mostly focusing on that sort of area today, but KCS is fluid, so um, absolutely uh, discussion and q and I'm sure will we'll span other phases as well. And um, I'll show you later, but if you pop onto our events page now, you will see the next three events in the series already open for registration for later in the year to focus on each of the other three phases. Speaking of our certified trainers, these are some of the wise and wonderful humans that are on the call today to advise you uh, with their wonderful experience. Um, any of your questions or anything you wanna just talk more about, dig into KCS. Here's how we're gonna spend our hour together today. First, I'm gonna give a little bit of a tour of current resources and dig into this sort of perspective of why we even talk about designing KCS. It's pretty important for success. Then our uh, lovely certified trainers will advise on your top challenges. So when you registered for this event, there was an optional question for you to share a challenge. Really pleased that 70 uh, of you actually entered something in that field. Not pleased that 70 of you are having challenges, but I love and appreciate that you shared your challenges because that's gonna make for great discussion uh, in our time together today. And then we'll leave about 15 or 20 minutes completely at the end for um, your live Q&A. Uh, anything else that comes up, comes to mind, your specific use case, We've been talking about KCS for more than 30 years. Uh, we're going to keep talking it for 30 years. So uh, whatever your situation is, we'd love to dig into it. So plan and design is the first phase of the adoption and transformation guide. We'll look more at that guide in a second, at least at a high level in the context of our other KCS resources. But this really is the premise for our discussion today. Why do we even design KCS? It's a methodology. Can't we just apply it? Can't we just turn it on? Well, no, we know that we can't. Um, because if we want KCS to be valuable and successful in our organization, it has to be custom to our environment. And so that takes a lot of adaptation. We want KCS to become the way we solve problems. It should never be something we do in addition. And so it really has to merge and meld with how we do work at, at our work in our environment. So designing is necessary. Thanks to wonderful and wise humans, in addition to our certified trainers, uh, folks have been iterating on KCS methodology for more than 30 years, I already mentioned that. So extensive, extensive resources are available in the consortium digital library. Uh, because we are nonprofit and our members are generous with their time and wisdom. Uh, we consider this you know, an intellectual property that we share free for public uh, via Creative Commons license. And so all of these things are available to anyone, even non-members. And this is what we sort of consider our core uh, resources when it comes to KCS methodology, uh, KCS principles and core concepts. This is what we say is absolutely non-negotiable. And this is really how you get aligned uh, between your organization and what makes KCS successful. The KCS V6 Practices Guide, that is uh, the examples and techniques. This is how you really operationalize KCS into your organization. It's how you make those non-negotiable principles and core concepts um, alive and well in your organization. And uh, lots of examples covered there. And then there's lots of folks doing things uh, with KCS that aren't covered there. And that's something we'll dig into a little bit uh, as well um, with the quote I'll share in a minute. Measurement Matters V6 is a really critical document because one of the big changes that an organization must undergo when embarking on a KCS journey is resetting uh, and rethinking about 
how they look at metrics, what metrics mean to them, how metrics are meaningful uh, to showcase or, or give insight into customer experience, employee engagement with knowledge, um, and find opportunities for continuous improvement. The things that we want to optimize um, sometimes shift, sometimes quite dramatically from what people are used to. So lots of guidance there to get folks aligned and on the right path. And then of course, the KCS Adoption and Transformation Guide, which is sort of the inspiration for our time together today. As I said, we'll be focusing a little bit more on plan and design, but as is mentioned in this wonderful guide, these phases are quite fluid um, and to interweave. And so can't really talk about one without dipping, dipping into the other. <clears throat> Some, a different perspective on these items that might be uh, clarifying in terms of how we uh, layer uh, our work when we think about things at the consortium, because uh, we have lots of other methodologies that we work on as well. KCS happens to be the most popular, the most widely adopted, is those principles that I mentioned. We see those, our members see those as principles of an adaptive organization, and they actually are the foundation for all the work we do in any methodology. And then we layer on things that get a bit more specific within each methodology and and they tend to get more adaptive for your environment. So core concepts are a bit different for each, um, but that's that non-negotiable layer. And then with practices and te techniques, that's really meant to adapt to your environment, hence designing to make it work for you. And I hinted at this quote. This is my most favorite quote in all of the hundreds and hundreds of pages of what we have captured. Uh, in the digital library for KCS. And I'm not going to read too, too much to you today, but I think it's worth reading through this whole quote that with the adoption guide, this guide is an invitation to success while it provides a step-by-step -step approach for planning a KCS adoption. It is not intended to be the only right way. Our aim is to share what we have learned about what makes for a successful KCS adoption and help you maximize the many benefits of doing KCS. So... I love this as just like kind of a guiding light, a reminder of why we're all doing this in the first place, where we're heading, that continuous improvement means continuous iteration. And when we see things captured in these wonderful resources, it's it's amazing because the, the challenges that we'll dig into a bit, uh, we were joking a little bit before this call, but we've been seeing the same challenges for 30 years as well. People kind of stumble over similar things. So on one hand, we, we can sort of say like, whatever your challenge or question is, like we, we have an answer for it and it's probably captured in one of these resources. And yet at the same time, it's, we're constantly evolving, we're constantly adapting to new environments. And that's why we have so much fun continuing to talk about this for 30 years and more. A little bit more digging into the plan and design phase of um, KCS adoption, just for context here, is it's really all about building a strong foundation so that we can sufficiently start wave one. And I like that for context setting that we want to plan and design with the long term picture in mind. But when it comes to making detailed decisions, uh, just like in KCS, our knowledge base articles should be sufficient to solve. They don't need to address every possibility. Uh, plan and design really is about getting on the, the right start so that we can sufficiently begin wave one. And that's why we want to build tools required for successful adoption. Now, when we say tools here, I'm gonna click through to a resource in a second. We don't mean uh, software or hardware. We mean your deliverables, your uh, communication tools to make sure that your organization is ready for success, gathering baseline me measurements and setting expectations, which is hugely important when it comes to starting a KCS journey. And that's why this phase of the adoption guide really focuses on the design session and the design session deliverables. So I'm actually gonna click through to this resource in the adoption guide. This is one of many useful pages here, but this is a really useful list 
to bookmark and come back to and kind of um, check yourself against because these deliverables are here for a reason. Again, 30 plus years of iteration and recommendation from members iterating on this methodology. These are all basically required. We don't, we sometimes say that folks um, think that uh, KCS is overly prescriptive and it's really meant to be adaptive. But in this case, we, we really are saying like, please do this because folks have learned the hard way that this is really what you need to be set up for success. We actually were very recently working with a member who was struggling a bit with their KCS program. They knew about KCS. They would have folks practicing it, uh, a successful wave one, more or less. They have executive buy-in, which is hugely important. Not even everyone gets that. And they still uh, were kind of stumbling around a little bit. And they, uh, you know, through some discovery sessions with them, we kind of uncovered that they maybe skipped a couple of these steps when they got started. And it can be tempting to do so. But these are all um, detailed out in the adoption guide with good reason. And if it seems intimidating, like this is a lot to get started, one thing to remember as noted here is that, again, sufficient to start first drafts, right? There's no reason not to create initial drafts of these documents. They don't need to be the perfect thing you'll use forever. Uh, you will absolutely iterate them over time, but they're really um, important, useful tools for getting started. It's, it's how you align what you're gonna do with the methodology. And quite specifically in the adoption guide, the plan and design phase is the only one now with what we call exit criteria, which is essentially a checklist that says, you should really have completed all of these things before you move on to future phases. The other phases of the, of, of the adoption guide have other methods that we look at, uh, success indicators, we call them, rather than exit criteria. So it's a bit of a different approach after this phase. So I'm, I've gotten a little soapboxy, I think, about this, but it's so important to, I, uh, to do these deliverables. So hope uh, that message was received. Now, before we move on to your KCS adoption challenges that again, I'm really pleased that you all shared so much with us. I wanna pop over, um, if you look on our website, which is, a, which is what I'm showing you here, we have our KCS overview page. This is what we call the KCS overview page, but I invite you to think about it more like the welcome center to the KCS National Park. This is where, <sighs> we really try to showcase high level and quick access to everything you will find available uh, in our KCS ecosystem for you. So if you're ever sort of wondering how to, to start a new phase or check yourself on wanting to um, see what's new or where you can improve your program, this is a great place to sort of make your landing page for KCS. We will always be here. We have our high level descriptions of what KCS is intended for and how we got here, our resources once again. So highlighted the core methodology, some additional resources. These are a little bit more fluid and evolving in terms of uh, case studies, um, trainings that are available, lots of events that we have like this all the time uh, for you to hear the latest and greatest. And like I said, KCS is continually evolving. Our consortium members have wonderful wisdom and energy to contribute to continually making these resources better for y'all. So in the last couple years, these are just some of the more major things that we've added to the methodology. Um, speaking of the Adoption Transformation Guide in 2022, it changed from just the KCS Adoption Guide to the Adoption and Transformation Guide. And a lot of updates happened as part of that. So if you haven't dug into that resource in a while, at least since 22, 2022, um, please do. Handling doubts and misconceptions is a great resource. When we talk through y'all's challenges a little bit later, uh, a lot of what you uh, posted in your registration field is covered in this document. And our members spent some time digging into the why behind each phase in the adoption guide, the why behind each practice in the practices guide, and a, a great additional uh, measurement resource called Understanding Success by Channel. All of this is here for you. A couple more things I wanna highlight on this page. Again, this is a great resource as a reminder, if you're looking for words to uh, use in your internal communication, these words are here for you to use. 
And then uh, a resource here about if you are just starting the journey, I know um, some folks in the chat and in their registration questions said they are much newer to KCS. So we have kind of a high level um, guide for you here to, to assess if it's right for you, start to take, take some training. Uh, an opportunity assessment is a great way to start to learn about your environment in ways that you would wanna adapt it, uh, adapt KCS for you. And then of course, as we're talking about today, designing for your environment and training and certification is really a great, great way to uh, speed up your learning curve. I'm not just saying that because our trainers are on the call and helping us today. The KCS Practices Workshop is an incredible way uh, to spend two and a half days really diving deep into the methodology and getting a, a really strong sense of what you need. And in fact, the member I mentioned a few minutes ago that we were working with recently that realized that they skipped a couple of steps at the beginning. I actually can't even take credit for helping them discover that. They went to a KCS Practices workshop recently, uh, again, for the first time in a couple of years. And it was after those two and a half days that they sort of came back with that light bulb, like, whoops, oh, we skipped a couple of steps. So hugely important. Even if you think you sort of know what's going on, it's a great refresher. And so always have lots of options there, easy to find from our website. If you ever need a quick reminder of the Solve and Evolve loop, you can find that here. We do have great member-only resources too. Uh, our members share more uh, detailed behind the scenes things, very active in member Slack and uh, member events is often where we are actually iterating the methodology. So if you ever want to be part of those great conversations evolving the methodology, then uh, being a member and participating that way is the best way to do that. And then on this page, you can find uh, most recent blog posts as well. So I hope you'll uh, bookmark and visit this page often. Okay, let's get back to your challenges. And now we can start to hear from our trainers. When we looked at those 70-ish responses that you all shared about what is a challenge you've encountered when implementing KCS, uh, they really fell into about four categories here. Um, for most of us, these are pretty familiar. I put a sample of you are all's words uh, here for each of them. So we're gonna talk about these uh, categories one at a time. So let's start with buy-in at all levels. A couple of the quotes that I pulled out here, executive buy-in, there were about seven different versions of basically these three words. So that's definitely a common challenge. Leadership understanding, uh, KCS, Folks thinking that this is additional work instead of just the the better way to do our work. Um, organizational buy-in, so that's that cross-functional alignment, understanding, reluctance to change, lack of investment. This tends to appear as lack of investment for both time and money needed uh, for for tools or 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 uh, humans <laughs> to to do some of this work. And then this was my favorite one that I like. I felt this one when I read it, the proving the value before I can prove the value. Oh, I uh, I know that challenge. I can totally understand it. So um, I'm going to invite our trainers to chime in. Y'all have been advising on this type of challenge, these, these issues for many years. How do you guide folks through these? Healing. Yeah, so I have found uh, in the many years of doing KCS that <clears throat> it's important to, before you even try to gather buy-in, you have to understand the problems that are trying to be solved at each level of the organization. So you need to know what the problem of your first line managers is. Like what are their top three things that are pain points for them? You need to understand what are the top pain points for your leadership and then executive leadership, like all the way up, right? So whatever the problems are that they are trying to solve, and then you need to try to find the ways that KCS is going to demonstrate value in helping them solve those problems, right? So for example, <clears throat> if I'm trying to do cross-organizational change, I want to understand how team A, team B, and team C work 
and where their pain points are. And then when I go talk to team A, I'm going to talk to team A specifically about, here's how I wanna help you solve these three problems. And we're gonna do it with this thing called KCS, right? So having that tie in to their actual problems that they're trying to solve helps them understand the impact, which helps with the proving the value before I can prove value, right? And it also helps them understand why they should care. Instead of it coming in as, we wanna do this thing, help us do this thing, because they just hear more work, right? Or you're gonna need my resources, you're gonna need my people, you're gonna take away from me and the things that I am being asked to deliver. Instead, you walk in the door with a, I understand that these are your problems, let me tell you how I can help, and it is a completely different conversation. And it makes it a lot easier to tie into that strategic framework because that's also the work you have to do already uh, for the strategic framework that Sarah was talking about is one of the top key deliverables on that list. And it makes it easier to tie into that too and then use that documentation to continue that uh, communication through. So that's my big thing is understand all the groups you're trying to tie into, whether it be executives, uh, first line leadership, other leadership and other parts of the organization, and then find out what their problems are and help them fix them instead of asking them to do more. That is great advice. Yeah, really, really tailoring the messaging to them and your environment, right? Not not repeating what you read in the practices and adoption guide as much as we think that that's, you know, the way we all want to talk. <laughs> Lana? Uh, yeah, to kind of build off of Keelan's point too, is just um, using the consortium and the members as success stories and finding things that align to um, their pain points, but also like, hey, it's worked in, in our competitor, in our specific space. It's worked in this area. I'm com confident that it's been proven to work. So the proving the value before I can prove the value, I can't show you with numbers here, but I can show you with numbers there. And that's powerful. That's great advice. Yeah, that, that sort of, that social proof that I'm not, we're not just making this up. We have right. evidence <laughs> yes. that this works. We got to give it a chance here. Right. right. That's so good. Caroline? Yeah, to add to what Lana said, I actually agree. Like the white papers are a great source of uh, information to find like real numbers, real money, dollar values, and all that. Uh, I found also even more powerful is when you can find someone, another company, another executive that is willing to talk with your company. And that is so helpful because then like it's pretty much another evangelic coming to talk to you and like it says it's even easier to executive one bit like pushing back. Um, so finding someone who's done it that you can talk to is extremely valuable for getting the brain from senior management and executives. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And that's perfectly in the spirit of KCS, right? Like we're, yeah. we're in this together. So the find folks who can who can share their their experience as well. Jennifer. Oh, I think you're on mute. Mm-hmm. Thank you. <laughs> um, the support team thinking that KCS is an additional task for them, I think uh, in my experience, isn't just the support team thinking it's more work, it's executives and management as well. My team doesn't have time for that, that you're asking them to do more work, you know, and so on. And I think that um, that myth <laughs> has to be busted, you know, in a way it, because when we hear KCS, we're going to be starting to write articles. We're all going to be contributing. Of course, they're going to jump to conclusions and think, oh, my gosh, that's more work. And be perhaps resistant, reluctant, or, you know, kind of push back. And, and to turn that around is to always be communicating about KCS and what it really is. Um, don't let them assume that it's more work. And then, you know, for days, weeks, and months think, I don't know, where, when am I going to have time? Um, I think it really is about changing the language and talking about KCS as a new way of working, right? Um, and how that, how knowledge being integrated into their, their work flow, uh, into the work that they're currently doing is how we should be talking about it versus like you're going to be writing articles, which every time will sound like more work. So it's changing the vocabulary to fit a different kind of, you know, narrative 
to guide people in understanding what this work really is. And when they start to understand, because we're always communicating the real work, they start to get into buying into it. I love that, Jennifer. Actually, we were uh, Matt and I were talking with another member just last week about how great they've been, how successful their you know first year of KCS has been. And we asked them to reflect and they said, yeah, we actually... When we think about our uh, the frequency and amount of communication at the time, we felt like we were over communicating. Like it yeah. felt like, right. are we really start talking about this again? And in hindsight, that's how that was the right amount of communication. Right, exactly like right. It. Yeah, that's awesome. Totally right. Great. Well, to be fair, Sarah, I don't think you can over communicate KCS. <laughs> To be fair. Um, yeah, no, but touching upon what, what Jennifer was saying, um, one of the things I found success with is, you know, kind of controlling the narrative a bit in the beginning, especially when we look to introduce KCS and what it is. Um, I don't dive into the nitty gritty details of what it is before I go through thoroughly the value creation element of it. So what value are they able to create? It was one of the things I saw very early on, especially where I am currently, is that people wanted to do more. They just didn't know what to do. They wanted to create knowledge, but they didn't know how to go about doing it. They didn't know how to find the time. They they just didn't know. It was so many, it was, you know, I want to, I want to, but I don't know. I don't have the time. I don't have this. I don't have that. So, you know, it was more about, it, it was gathering the excitement behind the potential value creation and explaining the path of value creation, right? So starting with the individual article that they create or even something that they start. They can't finish it, but they start it. And then showing them the whole progression of, you know, how we're helping to better serve customers, how we're reducing the cases that are coming in, you know, how this is really impacting our customer satisfaction scores and so on and so on, right? Then got them to see more bigger picture than the, oh my goodness, I don't have time to work on this specific article. So really, you know, keeping that to value creation, I have found has been just getting people more in that mindset where the the extra work didn't matter. The changing the process no longer mattered. Those things started to dissolve and fall away. So, you know, it was more about, you know, yes, we're going to do this. It's more of a process change. Um, it's not more about adding work, additional work onto your plates. You are already doing the work. You're already documenting things in the case. They're being documented in the wrong place, essentially, to help someone else. So let's get them documented the right way. Let's let's you know work on our technology piece here to make sure that you're doing at least you know lifting as possible um, and making sure that everything works. And you know. Together, we're going to get there and everybody sees the value. So I've seen that, you know, that kind of line of thinking, kind of controlling where people's thoughts are going. You know, it's all with how you start things off and how you introduce KCS and, and what it is. Yeah, wonderful. Hugely important. Uh, Keelan, I see your hand raised. I want to make sure we move on to the other topics here. So hopefully we can come back to your thought on that one. Um, but let's dig into the managing resources challenge. We had a bunch of folks uh, submit things about this, uh, feeling like we're a huge company, everything's disjointed, lack of resources to support the program in the way we need, uh, multiple tools, multiple knowledge bases. There were variations of this of this theme of folks sort of saying, saying like we we're doing lo lots of knowledge capture, but it's all it's all over the place. How are we ever going to get aligned? Uh, maybe we don't even really have uh, some standards or consistency for case management. So how can we? harness that into to organize knowledge management uh and then i think this one uh really summed up the 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 vibe of this category which is budgets competing priorities and fear of kpis who wants to chime in on this one how do you help folks here healing Here, I think kind of a key is to not try to swallow the entire elephant, right? Like make sure there's a new phrase that I learned this year and I love it. It's focus on the shark that's closest to the boat, right? So find the the group that is, is already excited about it um, and has said, yes, we may not have the time or the resources, but we want to see this succeed. And you start working with them first. 
um, because it's going to be very difficult for you to kind of bash your head against the same wall over and over again without, per the previous conversation, proving the value before I can prove the value, right? So a lot of that is going to be uh, to be very uh, specific and intentional on where you are asking for resources and where are you are dedicating your resources uh, to make sure that that you can kind of tackle you know the closest shark to the boat and making sure that you can have that forward momentum that then starts to build right because the problem is if you try to scatter shot and you try to to again eat the whole elephant all at once what you end up doing is just kind of hitting failure after failure after failure after failure and you don't get that momentum and you need that momentum to continue moving. So uh, using multiple knowledge-based tools across the organization, yes, that's frustrating, but that is a long, a long lead time project that's gonna have to be handled across like multiple years to figure that out. So start with one of those groups and focus on one of those areas and start to, to, to try to implement change in that one space. Don't look at it as we have to do everything all at once in order to make sure this is successful. And I will say that that is something when there are questions like this about resources, competing priorities, competing money, competing budget, it all comes down to breaking it into bite-sized pieces and making sure that you are tackling uh, the, the areas where you're going to have more success and starting there. Yeah, I love that. Uh, a lot of times we talk about continuous improvement as what's the next best thing to do? Like what what's achievable? If you have to, how micro do you have to get to find something, to scope something that's achievable? Well, then that that's your deciding factor of, of what to do next, right? Yeah, I love that. Michelle, your hand is raised up next in my order. Or did you just not lower it from before? I didn't lower it before. <laughs> okay, no worries. Uh, good, Caroline? thank you. Yeah, and I, I agree with Kevin. And I think like with resources like maybe start small also so like instead of having a whole team of knowledge management and big amount of people and so on have at least one person like leading being a program lead for this just start at least with one person and most likely on the long run it's gonna expand because people are gonna see the benefits people are gonna see like okay we want more of it um so we need to give you more resources to help you here um, and the resources is very much linked to our previous topic with the brain, having executives understanding like what's in it for them, what are they getting out of this so they can support your uh, investment requirements. So I, I would say like resources and brain is very much linked to, to each other. Um, the knowledge base parts, like when you have scattered knowledge base everywhere, I think it's every company has this. It's everywhere we've we've seen it in every company possible that you got knowledge bases or repositories all over the place so it's normal it's okay it can be managed uh sometimes it can be done with like some federated tools or whatever but like yeah it's it's something that you shouldn't be afraid of at the beginning it gets manageable over time and you know, there is either like through processes or through technology, you'll find a solution for this. Like, but you're not alone in that. Don't be <laughs> afraid. You're not the first company having this issue. It's everywhere. Yeah, once again, th this problem has been solved. We've we've figured out a, a method to solve it. There's still the work yeah. to do of figuring out how to do it in your environment, but um, certainly achievable. Yeah. Jennifer? Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I, you know, I think just adding to what's already been said under managing resources is really just acknowledging like this can be really overwhelming and the only way to kind of, you know, handle that approach that overwhelmingness is to kind of start small is to really kind of take on just a little bit at a time. It's so built into the methodology, right? We even adopt in waves when we move into the next you know, phase. And there's a reason behind that. It's because it's too much to try to do the whole organization at one time. So why would we do this part in that, that way of trying to do everything all at once? So I think it's really about starting small with those basics, those foundational elements of plan and design, your first versions of all those things, because you will, as you continuously improve, you will 
improve in all these areas as you go. And that's really what makes a successful KCS program long-term stick is that it's not just engineered, done, we did it. It's that we did enough to start. We learned from that. We did a little bit more. We learned from that, you know, and you keep going, you keep at it. Um, so it's like taking a deep breath, a little bit of a leap of faith, but really breaking it down into very much more manageable, you know, areas or chunks to get started. Yeah. So important. And I don't think that's easy by the way, <laughs> right. It might be clear. easy to kind of say like, just start small, um, <laughs> But it's really just figuring out where your low hanging fruit is and where your biggest opportunities are for success early on and really kind of, you know, gently moving you know, in that direction as you can. Yeah. Love that. Mm -hmm. Lana, I see your hand up. I want to move on to the next topic. Maybe you can chime in on this one, uh, which is content quality and knowledge sharing. Is this is this really where we're, we're, we're doing the KCS thing? Um the challenge with redundant KCS solutions, we've sometimes seen this as duplicate KCS solutions. So how do you handle that? Quality of articles, volume published to customers. Is it is it too much? Is it findable? Is it relevant? Uh, creation of valuable content for heavily customized products. How do you uh, capture something that's maybe useful if things are really customized on the end user side? Uh, end users not consuming the self-service content enough. Uh, so it... Uh, adoption challenges on the customer side. Uh, and really, I think this one summed it up quite well, which is find the right way to create, share, and keep updated the knowledge. How do we help people here? Jennifer? <laughs> okay, I have, all the, I have all the hands up. Apparently, I'm not sure what I did there. Um, the whole idea around co creation of valuable content for heavily customized products um my uh, my this is where i feel like some of us get to be a little provocative maybe in what i'm about to say which is yeah so what um mm -hmm. because knowledge is knowledge and sharing it is the most important thing even highly customizable environments products or scenarios with customers we've learned something from that experience. It may not be exactly repeatable with another customer, but there's always something we can learn from that experience that might help us solve a similar problem in the future. And um, that's the value. <laughs> um, and there's, there's, I think, a, it's an easy excuse to maybe not do KCS in a highly complex, unique environment but it is an excuse. <laughs> um, it's completely possible to do KCS successfully in those environments. It's understanding that we're sharing this knowledge with each other. That's also valuable, not just also with, not also, I guess, not as well as with customers, <laughs> but, but what about what we share with each other to help each other learn and know how to troubleshoot and understand problems enough to solve them specifically for customers. So that one really stood out to me on this list because, you know, I hear it, I hear it a lot and it's just, it's something to kind of get over that hump about, I think. Hi and Beth, I saw your hands up for a minute and then they went away. Do you, uh, either of you want to chime in? Um, I think Jennifer said almost everything I wanted to say. Just a little <laughs> thing I would like to add here is um, being a German, working in a German environment and have to deal with uh, typical German culture of um, trying to be perfect in all what you do. So this is one of the major learnings, I think, in the design sessions that I can tell the people, oh, it, it hasn't has to be perfect, sufficient to solve. So this idea of good enough to solve the customer's problem and it's okay to write the first draft and then send it to customer, make sure that it actually provides value. Um, this is what many of the knowledge workers we worked, we talked to um, then take as a relief. Okay, that's great. Yeah? Now, now, I'm, now I'm more or less a little bit um, less stressed. Yeah, that, that's great advice. I see other hands raised. I wanna move on to the other topic so that we have time for uh, folks Q&A, but um, hold those thoughts uh, if you can. Thank you. Uh, fostering a culture of collaboration. To me, this 
theme really covers the idea of how we sustain KCS long term. So uh, resistance to change. I thought it was interesting that this one this one repeated a little bit. I mean, we had um, what was reluctance to change when it came to buy in and resistance to change. So maybe reluctance to change is before it's happening. We're not so sure about this thing. And resistance to change is more about, well, now I'm tired of this constant change in iteration. So uh, some, some change fatigue there. Um, having to adjust measurements uh, across cross-functionally, which is really does become necessary for cross-functional support. Uh, time zones, <laughs> exclamation point. We love this one. Uh, global complexities low participation rates, uh, really cultivating the collective ownership mentality across the organization. And then this last one is another one that I, I sort of felt the not being the leader to drive the adoption and needing a leader to lead. Who has somebody to chime in here? Erin, I hear, I see your hand raised. I haven't heard from you yet. And then Beth, maybe Michelle, I do want to hear from you again, but Erin, do you want to chime in? Yep, uh, am I audible? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay, great. So I want to uh, go in on the uh, maintaining the redundant KCS solutions aspect. Uh, we in Ericsson IT, we have embarked upon uh, a way of, you know, uh, reviewing knowledge articles which have a low usage over a three-year and five-year period. So we have kind of set some kind of benchmarks and... Uh, you know, over a three-year period or a five-year period, if a knowledge article has a very low usage count or very low view count, that means the issue is just not happening. People are not experiencing that issue, so there's no point in keeping such an article, uh, you know, in the knowledge base. So we've, we're kind of encouraging our IT teams to review those articles, and if they mm -hmm. feel the need, they should just retire those articles. And if they still want to retain it, they they must, you know, review the contents thoroughly, so that it's kind of um, it's still there, but with a valid reason. Yeah, sounds like a great solution. We know KCS is demand driven, and so you're finding a way to sort of uh, use data yeah. to tune into the demand and respond accordingly. That's great. Uh, Beth, you. I've seen your hand up and down a couple of times. Do you want to chime in? Maybe not at this time. Michelle, what do you think? You know, so looking at the fostering a culture of collaboration. So, you know, currently in the environment that I'm, I'm working in, we have engineers that are working on rather complex uh, cases that are coming in. So they're already collaborating. So, you know, taking you know, taking a look at how they're collaborating and looking at kind of sliding or injecting knowledge into that and then making it as easy as possible for them to collaborate on, you know, not only solving the case, right? They're already doing that, but how do we add knowledge into the mix? Um, you certainly don't get there by systems that people can't access or they're locked down. They don't have the ability to, to chime in and collaborate. So, you know, having a a template, a knowledge base article that they can certainly work on together that at the end of this case, when they've resolved it, if they've resolved it, right, hopefully, um, they have a, a knowledge base article as a result to prove for all of that work. So, you know, making it, I, you know, my recommendation here is making it as easy as possible for teams to collaborate within the knowledge base article. The harder it is, people walk away. Um, you know, saying, well, you can just comment on the knowledge base article. People don't do that as much as we would would like them to do with, you know, and there's something to be said about collaborating in the moment, not leaving a comment on something afterward, right? So just kind of thinking about what processes we're designing to enable teams to collaborate and, and always keeping that collaboration in mind uh, versus command and control. Yeah, great advice there. Yeah, the, and just just make it as easy as possible. And that's what in the adoption guide why we revisit technology and things after we've learned a bit about how to do things. We and we want to really show the teams that we're continuously improving not just our knowledge capture, but the way that we are doing knowledge capture and um, evidence that we want to keep making it easier. So important, Lana. 
Hi, I wanted to talk to time zones, exclamation point. Um, <laughs> so it is an exclamation point because I think that KCS is one of the things that helps solve for time zone issues. Um, so when you don't have the opportunity to collaborate real time, how does that work? Oh, there's a whole process for that. We have our workflow. We have the, you can start your work in progress. You can search work in progress, see what other people are working on and you can work together, right? Not, you know, asynchronous, asynchronously <laughs> as well. So I think that um, where in a lot of traditional formats, you have to be right next to the person either physically or on chat at the same time in order to work together, there is a way and a process and a workflow that supports asynchronous working uh, when time zones are an issue. And that's KCS. <laughs> Love that. KCS is, that, is designed to accommodate time zones in a way, right? What was invented for? <laughs> Caroline? Yeah, it, it's also like the, the question of what was really meant behind the time zones question mark or exclamation mark. Mm -hmm. um, because in global environment, like if you're working with very large companies, uh, I do see time zones sometimes as a change for other reason than just the solve loop, capturing articles and then participating, collaborating. Uh, sometimes it's about being able to work together in, for example, coaching, if we try to do any kind of activities like calibration or team meeting or like council meetings, this kind of things, it can get very tricky when you have people based in the US, in Europe and in Asia Pacific. Uh, so something we've done uh, in multiple companies is to have sometime like uh, a lead a representative of a region, for example. So you might have like uh, a group of coaches that do meet on a regular basis, um, but you might have a group of coaches based in America's region, a group of coaches in the European region, a group of coaches in Asia Pacific, and they will have a lead coach or a representative of that group um, that then they all those three people will meet together to make sure that they are aligned, that the concerns are being discussed at a global level at that case. Um, and that facilitates for like time zone challenges. Um, so having a lead representative, whether it's a lead coach, managers, whatever it is, uh, I found that very helpful also. So I'm not sure if that was the question behind the time zones, but, <laughs> no, but this I is a topic behind time zones and regions. Yeah, that, that's absolutely great advice. Some folks in the chat agreeing with you there. So thanks for that. Let's dive into some live Q&A. Does anyone who's on today, uh, I know there's been a lot happening in the chat. I can't wait to read all of that later. I haven't been, even been able to keep up with it, but any open questions in the chat or folks folks on the call? Um, William, Maya, I see your hand raised. Yeah, feel free to take yourself on, off mute and ask a question. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, I actually put it in the chat as well. But um, with the rise of AI, we have heard some fears of, you know, uploading articles to KCS only for it to then get trained to, you know, for the AI. So we have had fears. How can we provide that reassurance to those people that, you know, they're not going to just be doing this with the hope of, you know, training that, that they'll still have job security? Great question, Keelan. So just to make sure I understand the question, essentially agents are afraid that if they're just training the robots to take over the jobs, how are they still going to have the jobs, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, so um, the the short answer is that it has been proven over and over and over and over and over and over again that there always has to be a human element no matter how much AI you slap at something right? There's always going to have to be that backend research to validate, to make sure that the information that the AI is using is correct, to ensure that all of that information is, um, is uh, healthy, right? And, and being used in the right way. And using, especially for organizations that are moving to AI, using KCS as that use case to, to go, okay, you want a healthy AI? you have to have a healthy KCS environment. Because this is like saying to agents, we are training you to be the people behind the AI so you still have a job, right? We are shifting the work from just closing tickets to 
being the people who are responsible for understanding that backend data, which is the knowledge articles that's going to drive the AI, and that's going to shift your job more toward toward uh, that that knowledge worker, right? That person who's there to to be that human interaction behind the AI and make sure that it's not garbage in, garbage out on the AI side. So really KCS is that training model to shift people from being just the ticket closers to being ready to shift to an AI world where they are helping that model and they still have a job. Yeah, I love that advice. I mean, really it's the beginning of a new ongoing collaboration yeah. with AI. Your, your, your job is to forever from now on train AI, not just do exactly. it Exactly. And then exactly. be eliminated. Yeah. Kai? It's exactly what you just said is um, just tell the people about that the AI is good in correlation, but very bad at causality. So it does not understand what it's proposing. So it needs the human being, it needs our intellectual capacity to decide which of the many maybe relevant articles are the right ones or not. So there's, like she said, it's always the, the human factor. Great one. And jump five, I see your head raised. Thank you, very interesting session. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure what exactly is my question, but my question is regarding AI. Um, I wanna know, is it a layer on top of KCS or um, how would this work? Should we prepare ourselves um, in AI skill as um, KCS or KCS would introduce any AI related sessions? I'm just trying to understand how AI will impact. Thank you. That's a great question. Before any trainers chime in, we have a recently uh, recorded session where David Kay, another a certified trainer, uh, did a whole presentation with demonstrating use cases for uh, AI in KCS. I believe my colleague Kelly will drop that link in the chat as soon as she has a second. Um, so that's a great, uh, great thing. Yes, I knew she was going to. There it is. Thank you, Kelly. Um, so recommend you go check that out. Definitely. Uh, what do you have to add, Caroline? Um, I would say like you have to look at it the way that AI is a technology and not a methodology. So KCS is a methodology, so it's going to help you with your processes and how to adopt like best practices on knowledge sharing, these kind of things. AI is a tool. So it doesn't matter, like the tool is what the methodology will be able to leverage or vice versa, like the tool can leverage the methodology uh, to get uh, sharing practices out of this. So they don't go against each other and they can support each other, right? So yes, it's going to require new skills to know how to use AI. It's going to definitely have new challenges. Um, but I believe like already in the current environment of KCS, we do see a lot of things that we will be using like coaching, we're going to be using a lot of those kind of skills, just in different technical environments. Nice. Yeah. Like, fine. Let's find opportunities for the AI to do what AI yeah. is great at. And then that actually exactly. adds capacity for humans to do our important things. Yeah. Beth, I see your hand raised. Right. I think that uh, in the world of AI um, innovation, Within the consortium, there's a lot going on. Um, there are some ex exceedingly interesting activities going on that we don't ac actually have a chance to get access to. But also members of the consortium are experimenting with how teams can work together with AI. Um, because with the, not only in the KCS, but with intelligence forming, AI is going to be a significant tool to make it easier for us to understand how to get the best work to the right people. To get the work to the right people is important. Fewer bouncing tickets, you know, and there's a lot of um, benefit in having AI experimentation within your teams um, and sharing what your results are so you can bring people together more um, around that and get people to feel more confident that it's okay to test this out within realms of, you know, making sure that we're protecting the data. But certainly the big message is that we're always going to need to check before we can use. So if we are going to write using AI, which people are starting to do, to make, make it easy to create a bullet-pointed article, 
hey, by the way, wouldn't we like to do that? <laughs> you know, I mean, we've been waiting for a long time for something like that, but also to assist us with narrowing down simple into simple articles that may have been prosy from a, a case. Uh, so I'm, I'm expecting that there will be a lot more experimentation and teams could do a lot with that. Um, so it's a matter of making that kind of a challenge or if you have a resistance from management, you know, suggesting to management how you might bring together the team to experiment a little so they have some input. Yeah, I love love that advice. Hugely important. I mean, that's that's something we haven't explicitly said uh, today, but absolutely true with everything you do with KCS is involving the team. Uh, we often say, if it's about us, don't do it without us. So involve folks in the decision making um, and br bring them along on the journey. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much for all this advice on the the challenge statements and the, the great questions from our audience here today. This page that we're looking at here, uh, we will email out to everyone and uh, add the recording onto it as soon as we have it processed so you can use this as a resource. Uh, one more uh, wrap up section here at the bottom, just uh, some, some quick reference of the things that we do in the plan and design phase and and why we want to do them. So this is an excerpt from that resource that I mentioned, the why behind each phase. So um, once again, really important to, to, to make use of the great advice of these resources here uh, to set yourself up for success on this journey. I hope we'll see you at another event soon. Like I said, we already have a bunch um, open for registration. So please register and we'll see you soon. And a couple more resources just at the bottom of this page. Uh, uh, when you pop back on here later, if you're interested, details about those changes to the adoption guide that happened a couple years ago. I mentioned KCS training from our amazing certified KCS trainers uh, and some advice about um, seven, seven top tips for getting started with KCS if you're interested. Thank you all so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. And Thanks I so can't much. wait to see you at the next one. See you guys. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.